So humanistic psychology, um, as we said in the lecture on existential psychology, humanistic psychology um, really is in its heyday in the 1960s and 70s. Um, there are some very, uh, the whole idea of pop psychology or popular psychology comes from the humanistic school, which was less um, tied to academia and, less, and, and really thought that a lot of its ideas could be used um, without professional um, guidance. And so we had books like Free to Be Me, Free to Be You, or Free to Be You, Free to Be Me, I think is actually the title. Um, that, you know, but the whole idea of, um, of self-improvement um, really comes from humanistic psychology. Um, and, you know, my, my little psychedelic background here uh, is reflective of the fact that the, the culture of the 1960s and 70s really does inform these ideas in some important ways. Um, and we're going to talk about Carl Rogers and Maslow here. Um, and... So Carl Rogers um, gives us, uh, both of them focus on an idea called self-actualization, and they talk about it in different ways, but that is going to be a basic idea that we have. Um, and self-actualization in a very basic way is becoming um, the most kind of advanced, the most healthy version of yourself, um, and that both of them believe that that is our basic um, goal that we should be striving for self-actualization. So I want you to think about, from Roger's point of view, um, you can think about the hobbies, um, volunteer activities, kind of all those extracurricular things that people do um, just because they want to, not because they're gonna earn the money or prestige or anything else, but just because they want to engage in those activities. And that is probably the moment when many people are at their most authentic. Um, some of us are very fortunate and have jobs that feel very authentic. Um, I have to say that I feel very fortunate in that. I feel like um, my job teaching and my job as a therapist both feel like they reflect um, uh, internally driven um, things for me, that they are important to me all you know, in and of themselves. Um, one way of judging that when you have a job is like, you know, it's hard for me to imagine a time coming up in the near future where I would want to retire. Um, I'm sure it'll happen someday, but but that it's, I'm not working to get to retirement. I'm not counting down the days to retirement. Um, and people who are working in jobs where all they can think about is when they get to stop doing the job, right, are doing jobs for money. And that's absolutely fine. But those same people may si still be doing hobbies or volunteer things that are simply uh, driven by internal motivation. Um, and so for Rogers, um, those things that we do because they're internally driven reflect um, what he called our organismic valuing process that come from that process and our self-actualizing tendency. And both of those are this kind of subconscious guide. So it's not a conscious process, but a subconscious guide that evaluates each experience that we can choose um, for its growth potential. And so, um, you know, whether that's a new job or whether that is uh, an activity with friends, that there's this internal process, if, and, and some people pay attention to that more than others, it says like, is this going to be essentially a good thing for me? Is this going to help me become an even better person or move forward in my life in some way? Um, and if we're listening well to that guide, then we make we make better decisions for ourselves. Um, it, you know, if our if our choices are strongly influenced by other people or outside source forces, then um, we're going to not have as healthy a personality, and we're not going to be moving towards self actualization, especially if that's happening a lot. So for young people, um, often the risk is that your choices um, for life path and for activities will be determined too strongly by uh, what your parents want for you. And I think that is often a struggle in our teen years and young adolescents is to think about what our parents want versus what we want for ourselves. Um, my parents loved me very much and wanted me to have a happy life. They had a hard time though, when I was college age, imagining that the choices I was beginning to make were going to lead to a happy life. Um, so it wasn't that they didn't want me to be happy, they just had a hard time, they, they were worried that I was making bad choices or making choices that would restrict my life uh, as opposed to expand it. Um, and so that, that was most clear when I um, decided to pursue a PhD in psychology. Um, I remember my mom actually being um, distressed um, and saying to me at one point that she thought that in making that choice that I was giving up marriage and family um, and that I would regret it later. Um, I didn't see that those were choices I had to make and, and certainly that is partly generational. Um, I didn't see why I couldn't have a PhD and marriage and children and, and 
did. Um, but so, you know, but if I had listened to her fears um, or been afraid to do what I thought was right for me, even though she didn't think it was right for me, um, then I would not have been following an authentic path, right? I wouldn't have been um, moving towards self-actualization. Um, so, so those are the things that Rogers focused on quite a bit. Um, and for Rogers, there were five signs of a healthy personality, um, and you guys had a reflection that asked you to kind of rate yourselves from one to ten on each of these. And openness to experience um, is, is mostly the same as the big five trait we talked about, though it is much more in a straightforward way, how open are you to experiencing new things? Um, so not the other aspects of openness um, there. So how open are you to experiencing new things? Um, existential living is about um, mindfulness, as we now talk about it, but living fully in the moment. Um, so being willing to just give yourself over to the moment of whatever is happening. Um, organismic trust goes back to those ideas we were just talking about a moment ago, that the idea that you rely on inner experience to guide your behavior rather than outside forces. Um, experiential freedom is the idea that you determine or can determine your own path. Um, and creativity is really kind of flexibility. So it's not creativity in an artistic way, but it's about not being locked into certain behaviors. And so for Rogers, this is really, these five things are in part a guide to uh, signs of whether you are healthy, but also kind of guideposts that if you want to self-actualize and you want to live an authentic, healthy existence, that these are the things we should be aiming for. Um, Rogers also talks, and you had a self-reflection about this as well, about the difference between the real and the ideal self. Um, and um, this is the questions that you were asked to think about in terms of how, what, you know, how would you describe yourself and how would you like to be? So how am I versus how should I be or, or do I wish I was? Um, and for Rogers, the more discrepant these are, the bigger the differences between these two things, the more worried we would be about personality, um, that self-actualization requires that these things be close together. They're, they're often not going to be the same, that often we, you know, we want something different than what we are. Um, but when they're far apart, um, then we feel unhappy um, and we actually um, are not, we, we're not self-actualized and not on the path to self-actualization. Um, and, and we can have an ideal self. The other important distinction Rogers makes is that we can have an ideal self that is self-generated, that's internally produced, um, and that we therefore can work towards. Uh, but that is different than, for example, wishing you um, your physical appearance met the cultural ideal more, right? Um, wishing you had curly hair because that would make you happy, um, you know, uh, is different than I wish I had certain kind of hair because then others would find me more attractive. That's a different thing, right? And most of most of this, of course, is not about physical appearance. It is, um, you know, I, I wish I was more outgoing and, and I'm not. Um, but you have some control about whether you can at least develop some behaviors that are more extroverted, right? Um, and, and so uh, paying attention to why do you have that wish? Is it because others would like you better? Is it because somebody else would think that was a better way of being? Um, or is it because you truly um, you know, want to head in that direction? Um, and so, uh, so paying attention to that for Rogers is very important. Um, and then Rogers gives us this idea of unconditional positive regard, and um, a lot of his discussion of this is about the importance of giving children unconditional positive regard, and then the consequences or outcomes if we get that in childhood or don't get that in childhood. So unconditional positive regard essentially is um, is uh, being seen as good and worthwhile um, regardless of, with, without conditions. Right, and so it's not, um, you know, you would be perfect if, it's you are perfect. Um, doesn't mean you do, everything you do is perfect, but that you as a being are worthwhile um, and loved. Um, and I might wish that you, know, you behaved in different ways, I might get mad at you for behaving in certain ways, but I never stop thinking that you are lovable and worthwhile. Um, and that happens in most families. I mean, in most families that just happens. Um, but there are families in which parenting looks more like um, telling a child that they're stupid or telling a child that they're lazy or telling a child that they have characterological traits that are unacceptable in, in one way or the other, um, which is different from saying, I need you to listen to me better, um, right? So it's about characterological traits and the rejection um, 
saying that I, you know, that my love is conditional on you being more of this. Um, and so if that's the case, and you can see maybe how quick, how uh, directly this might connect to the idea of the real and the ideal self, because if you have grown up in a place where you are told over and over that there is some other version of you that would be better, then your sense of ideal self may very well be based on that, and, and, um, and that, because it's externally defined, is going to have very little, perhaps, in common with your real self. Um, and, um, and that ideal self is going to be the conditions that the parents set that would have been better. Um, and the, you know, the really good news here is that Rogers thinks that we come into adulthood at a disadvantage if we don't get this in childhood, but that adult relationships can still provide it and, and then, then you know, that would reshuffle things for us. And Rogerian therapy is all about a therapist um, providing unconditional positive regard. Um, learning to love the patient in front of them, the client in front of them, um, for who they are, for their authentic um, kind of central being, um, even if um, there are things about that client that you think are problematic in one way or the other, that you that you can give them unconditional positive regard and make them feel heard and make them feel well regarded. Um, so I think that that, yep, that is where we're going to end this video, and um, we'll pick up, and the second video will be about Maslow.